Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Today I thought we'd have a look at a user mission which was made by Frank NN, and the reason why we're having a look at it is because it's for the i250, or as some of you may know it's the MiG-13. Now the reason I wanted to have a look at this today is first of all because, well, the plane itself physically is modelled incredibly well. It does use the flight model of the LA-9, so it doesn't give a realistic expectation of what the I-250 would give you. But at the same time, it offers an idea which really isn't talked about too much in War Thunder. And this idea is the idea of mixed propulsion. We don't actually have uh, any aircraft, or we don't actually have many aircraft, I should say, which have mixed propulsion systems. Uh, you know, sometimes I suppose you have the rocket boosters uh, from certain aircraft, uh, but when it comes to actual just out and out, you know, a propeller uh, aircraft with a standard engine, but also has on top of it some form of motor jets, that idea just hasn't really made it to War Thunder. And it would be nice, especially from the Soviet point of view, because it was heavily developed, to see that in game. So the story of the I-250 starts in 1944. Germany itself has uh, pushed forward when it comes to the jet age. The ME-262s are starting to be seen. There are a bunch of other stuff which has also started to be seen. There are reports of stuff like HE-162s, ME-163s, and the Soviets at this point are pretty behind when it comes to jet technology. They were aware of successful British and also American jet projects and also, of course, the Germans being able to deploy their own. So therefore, they looked for solutions to be able to counter uh, these ideas. And one of them was in the form of the I-250. The idea was to create a mixed power solution with what was known as the VRDK, uh, which was a uh, motor jet or an air reaction compressor jet, the Vodushno uh, Rea, uh, I think it's Reativni, uh, <laughs> the uh, Gatel Compressionil, uh, which I'm sure I said completely wrong. And this would be powered by the Klimov VK107 V12 engine. Uh, which one of the versions you can actually find in the game on the uh, premium, uh, I believe the premium Yak 3 that we have in the game, you know, at uh, rank 5, uh, uh, which isn't in the tree anymore, which is kind of interesting. But the main thing is the Klimov uh, engine, uh, the VK-107, the version that we see here, was not just used on the I-250, it was also used on the Sequoia Su-5, uh, which was a mixed power prototype. So yeah, the, the general idea of this was to create, you know, some kind of mixed propulsion system, and then when in the air, when near the battlefield, the, uh, the motor jet part of the engine would be able to kick in and give it a little bit of extra power. And whether this actually worked or not in practice uh, will soon be seen. So the VRDK it was a motor jet, as we talked about, so some form of rudimentary type of jet engine. Now the external power source drove the engine's compressor, simple as that. It forced air into the stainless steel combustion, combustion chamber, uh, where fuel was sprayed from seven nozzles and ignited to exhaust out the variable rear nozzle. And in the I-250, a 1,650 horsepower Klimov VK-107 piston engine was used to this to, uh, as the primary power plant. And after takeoff, a clutch at the end of the crankshaft could be engaged, which drove a step-up gearbox with the ratio of 13 to 21 to an extension shaft that powered the compressor of the VRDK. The air for the compressor was fed through a long duct uh, that ran from the inlet underneath the propeller spinner and thence under the engine and through the belly of the aircraft. The duct also fed air to the oil cooler near the engine, uh, but the water radiator was positioned behind the compressor to maximize airflow over it. And then there was a secondary duct led to the main duct uh, to the VK107 supercharger. When the VRDK was running, uh, the secondary duct had diverted from that additional air to the supercharger, which boosted the engine's output to 2,500 at 7,000 meters. 
The increased airflow over the engine radiator helped to dump the engine's excess heat into the exhaust stream, and however, the VRDK was limited to only 10 minutes operating time per, per sortie, which meant that it was useless weight during the rest of the flight. So basically, the, the jet part of the engine uh, was uh, gave it a ton of horsepower, gave it around about 900 horsepower, so a big boost compared to just the conventional engine. But it was only able to be used for about 10 minutes in flight, so you'd have to engage it when you know you were really required to. And the main issue with having something which is only useful for 10 minutes of a flight is yes, it gives you that boost in that little bit, but then on top of that, it is just excess weight at the end of the day. And uh, there was other things which made this thing incredibly heavy. It was an all-metal aircraft with a monocoque uh, fuselage. This made the plane a lot heavier uh, than previous designs. And uh, overall, when it came to it, it was made incredibly compact. Think about how a lot of these designs from the Soviets, such as stuff even like the MiG-9, the Act 23 when they went into full, you know, uh, jet production, they were a hell of a lot smaller than some of their counterparts, uh, such as the American jets and the meteors uh, that were around at the time for the British. So, the yeah, I-250 was no different. It was one of those machines which had a huge nose on it, the cockpit mounted on the back, very similar to what you would see from a Yak-23, which you could see in-game. And basically, when it came to uh, a lot of the areas, this was reserved for fuel, and it was also reserved for cannons. Uh, so the way that the uh, fuel worked uh, contained uh, 412 liters uh, in the fuselage and also a 100 liter tank in each of the wings, uh, which was uh, basically there just to keep this thing in the air. The other thing as well, uh, when it came to the general design of the guns, it was supposed to have one centrally mounted 23 uh, through the engine and then two 12.7s on top, but instead what ended up happening is they went for three 20 millimeter B20 Berezins, and Berezins are incredibly fun uh, machine uh, cannons if you've ever used them in a game like War Thunder. A lot of punch behind them and a lot of aggression, uh, which is really, really nice to see. Another thing to also mention about uh, this machine is it actually did go into active service, uh, technically. Uh, there was a few of them built uh, under the name the MiG-13, which was its uh, actual, you know, uh, operational name, uh, because of the fact that it was built by McCoy and Garevich, and the main issue it ran into is the same issue that a lot of these run into. Uh, it never really uh, exceeded its full potential because of issues that it had running this dual propulsion system. There was a lot of them which had issues such as they weren't even delivered uh, with the uh, mixed propulsion system, uh, which is obviously a real issue. If you have a look at stuff such as the 3810102, it was assembled in January of uh, 1946, um, and the motor was delivered on January the 6th, and due to the destruction of the compressor blades, the power plant was dismantled and sent back. Then there was other stuff such as the 3810105. This was assembled in March and the motor was delivered in the March 8th, but also without a compressor. And then the later numbers, the 6, 7, 8 and 9, uh, they were in the process of final assembly, but they were suspended due to the fact that they had a lack of motors. They really struggled to be able to, to build this thing just because of the fact that it was just taking them so long to be able to build the motors for the machine. And by the point that uh, this thing actually entered service, um, which was pretty much 1946, because the first and the second prototypes were tested in 1945, and let's just say the results of those prototypes weren't exactly the best. Uh, the first prototype unfortunately crashed on July the 5th, 
and the aircraft crashed over the central airfield, uh, named after MV Frunz, and the pilot's AP Deev was actually killed. And uh, basically what had happened with the aircraft is that the controls had stiffened up and they had locked, especially the rudder controls, um, when he was going above about 650 kilometers an hour and he had to bail, the chute didn't come out in time and he, well, became jammed. And then uh, when it came to the second prototype, uh, which was around the thing, uh, the second prototype went a lot better, but it still had a ton of engine issues, and there was an accident with that too. Uh, in October the 18th, 1945, where test pilot A.N. Chernobrov uh, made an emergency landing in the Kutsevo Philly area. Uh, it was repaired though, so that gave at least you know the Soviets a little bit of uh, belief in the machine. But then, on July 12, 1946, this was when the aircraft was in production, technically, uh, even though not many were built, a fire broke out due to a defect in the engine, and as a result of which the pilot had to land in an emergency order at the airfield of Lyrbertsi, and the I-250 number 2, which was once again the prototype aircraft, received significant damage and was not restored, because by that point, as we talked about, stuff like the MiG-9 was coming along, stuff like the MiG-15 MiG was coming along, there was really no need for a vehicle of mixed propulsion because of the fact that they'd already been working on their jet side of things. So yeah, it's kind of an unfortunate story for something like the I-250, but it is and does represent something which would be really nice to see in game, which is a little bit more of these mixed propulsion machines. As always, I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time. I'd like to thank Ambrosius McClellan, B. Young, Battling Bacon, Blackie, Chris Giltnane, Conte Baraka, Daniel Stanton, Elove Goat, Jay Wilt, Martinez, Trigger Hippie, Universe, Eugene's Terry, and also AI'm Devilish and Samuel Slick for supporting the channel.